Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, this is our final seminar in the series looking at climate change. For those of you who've made it to every single one or nearly every single one, thank you. I think it's been a fantastic audience every time. We've had some really engaging questions. Um, for those of you watching online, welcome. For those of you in the room, um, please can you make sure your devices are on silent, but please do tweet. Um, the hashtag is 2015climate, and if you are watching online, do feel free to tweet a question, and I'll try and get it in at the end. Before we start, I'm just going to highlight a, a new event that's been added to our roster, which is next week, the 4th of June. Um, the International Strategy Office, ourselves and the Blavatnik School of Government, are very uh, privileged to have uh, Montek Singh Alawalia come to speak. He, until recently, was um, the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission for India, and he's going to be looking at um, Indian economic pr prospects under the new government. It should be a fascinating insight, um, and I think we'll, we'll have a really good debate at that one. You need to register for that, so please do look at our website. But back to today, we're very lucky to have um, Professor Cameron Hepburn. Um, he heads up our Economics of Sustainability, have I put that the right way around? Um, program at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which is part of the Oxford Martin School. And Cameron's background um, focuses a lot on energy, climate, and their relationship to economics. So he's going to talk today about whether we can actually create a more sustainable economy. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was just described as being unsafe a moment ago, so that was a, that was a much kinder introduction and a suitably short one. Um, thank you all for being here today, and um, hello to everyone online. I've been you uh, for the last two terms, really. I haven't made a single one of these events in person, uh, but have been catching up with them. So I don't know how many others there are like me, but if you're listening, hello. Um, so, A Wealthy, Healthy Planet, Creating Green Economic Growth is my title today. Those of you who came to the Paris and Beyond series that I co-convened last term uh, would have heard me speak on climate policy and some deadly serious game theory. And I have to admit, it was extremely tempting to just roll out the same talk, uh, <laughs> given that the two series mapped up fairly well. But that's not what I'm going to do, so uh, we have some fresh material. Uh, what I will do, though, is start with at least a very, very brief summary of the main messages of that uh, talk from the Paris and Beyond series, in case you missed it. Um, and there are, of course, seven other extremely good, if not better, I would say better, presentations uh, online from that series, if you want to have a look at them. Um, then I'll address the question of... Yeah, is the planet in crisis? Crisis? What crisis? Uh, so, so there are some crises, there are some non-crises, and I think it's fairly important that we distinguish between the problems that matter and those that don't. Then do a short detour into the objective, because if you're going to think about green economic growth, it's worth, worth having a prior think about what for, you know, why would we want it, uh, and what are we really aiming at. Then talk about how to create this thing, green economic growth, and wrap up. So that's the, the plan. Uh, so let me get straight into it. Main messages. Um, the talks are online. The first message is that if you think about game theory seriously for a little bit of time, it tells you that the structure of any international agreement on climate change needs to be one which is incentive compatible, which is to say we want people to have an interest to join and then to stay in the coalition. And one of the challenges we've had at the moment is we haven't really had the tools, carrot or stick, to entice countries in to a deal or to beat them over their head to keep them in or at least you know, uh, use a second carrot to keep them in once they're in. And one of the core conclusions, I would say, of a fairly large literature within economics, it's, it's not one in which you know, I, I deserve much or indeed any credit, is that um, the, the structure of the club that you want to, to create is exactly that. It has the, f the, the, the dimensions of a club where you get major benefits from being in and costs from being out. Uh, and there are reasons for thinking that a club based around clean technology might be easier to structure and have better incentives than one based around emission cuts. 
So I'll leave you with that. If you want to hear more, you can see more. The second key implication of game theory is in the sequencing of a deal. The big players have to go first, and we are heading in the right direction in the lead up to Paris with the China-US deal late last year, so that's a positive. Uh, the next key implication is that we would want to be focusing on self-interest. It's not to say that you don't use all of the other levers and make the most of people's altruism, make the most of the Germans' phenomenal willingness to support uh, renewable energy, bring costs down, you'll find it. Plenty of economists will tell you it's completely nuts and totally irrational, but you could consider it as a, a remarkable gift to the rest of the world that the Germans are willing to pay that, uh, those costs to bring those, uh, bring those costs down. But, so, but start with self-interest despite that case study because it's, it's unfortunately gonna be the exception rather than the rule. The next key conclusion was that you'd better have a mechanism for punishing the bad guys, whether they're my guys, like the Aussies, or the Canadians. If there's no consequence of just walking away, washing your hands, digging up more coal, generating more tar sands, then the time will come when the incentives are such that countries will do that. And we just, uh, we're nowhere on this point, really, in all honesty, uh, in the lead up to Paris. We'll get a deal, it, it'll be very happy. Everyone will be very um, excited. But we still won't have a mechanism for properly enforcing countries that don't live up to their commitments. Uh, talking about shaming countries, you know, popular opinion, et cetera, is what people mostly do. And I'm not saying that's nothing, but it hasn't worked in the case of Canada, it hasn't worked in the case of Australia, and if it does, doesn't work in the case of those two countries, who I would think are at least somewhat amenable to shaming, how well is it gonna work in the case of many other countries, you could name them, I could name them, who are probably less concerned about being shamed. So this is, uh, for my mind and my money, one of the key missing ingredients uh, in any big deal. Um, I've proposed many years ago with Dieter Helm and others the idea of border carbon adjustments. Many others have uh, also suggested that we use those sorts of similar mechanisms, but I think they're a core <coughs> missing piece of the Paris deal. So that was it. That was, I hope, short enough. Justifies the claim that I'm not really merely repeating the previous talk. And now on to some broader and newer things. So, uh, planet in crisis. Um, Let's unpack that a bit. <clears throat> so throughout history, we've had distinguished scholars, distinguished economists saying we're at, the, uh, we're at the edge, or at least if we're not at the edge now, at some point we will hit a moment where we need to stop or we will need to want to stop economic growth. We've had John Stuart Mill saying we need to deliberately guide the economy towards a stationary state to avoid an environmental collapse. We had John Hicks. Uh, suggesting that population needed controlling, uh, and once it was controlled, the stationary state is not a horror, an objective at which to aim, and so on, Keynes and Jan Tinbergen. Um, so there is pedigree to this idea, but I'm gonna challenge it, and in two ways. Firstly, as you can see from this nice little, uh, this nice little diagram here, uh, we have a certain amount of solar radiation coming into the Earth's biosphere, the economy sitting within it, uh, heat coming up from the core and a bit of gravity and some heat loss here. Now, the energy that we need to power our economy every year is around 500 exajoules, a bit more, uh, but it's not thousands of exajoules, not even a thousand exajoules. The solar radiation we have coming into the biosphere is 5.5 million exajoules every year. There is plenty of the stuff. Energy is scarce in economic terms only because we haven't thought hard enough about, and cleverly enough, about how to capture it, and to, I mean, capture it in an economic sense, obviously it can't be created or destroyed, but to, for, to get it and to use it in, in humanly useful forms. And we're only really starting to put our brains to that purpose now. So I think we are awash with energy whether it's solar or fossil or the rest of it. And that is not gonna be the thing that slows us down and wipes us out. So let's kind of cross that one off. We're not gonna run out of energy. Peak oil, forget it, you know, it's fine. Okay, uh, what about running out of stuff? 
So we've had forecasts since time immemorial, or well, perhaps not immemorial, but a long time, uh, of us running out of various materials. So I'm going to plot here on the horizontal axis the year in which a forecast might be made. Uh, so in 2000, we might be making a forecast. And uh, then we're going to forecast the year of exhaustion of a particular mineral here. So in 2000, we might forecast that you know, tin will be exhausted by 2020, say. And I've drawn two lines on this chart. You can see they have the same gradient. They both slope upwards. They're effectively a 45 degree, I mean, they're not 45 degrees, but they're the line that tracks a year for a year. So as every year goes past, another year's supply is added to the economically recoverable resorbs, reserves. And then uh, along with colleagues at, at INET, at the Oxford Martin School, we've plotted the evolution of those forecasts for a number of materials. And I don't know whether you'd be surprised, but I was delighted to see that this is how they look. They all track those beautiful dotted red lines. In short, as every year goes by, we find enough new stuff to replace the stuff that we used in the previous year, more or less. Okay, things wobble around. There's the odd exception. But the broad message I want you to take away is that we're not running out of stuff not running out of min minerals and et cetera. We're not running out of energy, we're not running out of minerals. So kind of crisis, what crisis? Well, um, uh, you, you might think we should chill out and relax. And I understand that there are 31 people going to the King's Arms to have a drink uh, after this, if you wish to discuss these things further. Unfortunately, I'm not, I'm going home to read bedtime stories. But the last time I saw 30 people in a pub uh, to have a drink was when I got my British citizenship. But, uh, but so have a good time, perhaps. Uh, but you're all here because you know there are real problems. So I'm not gonna pretend there aren't. We have real problems on biodiversity. The state of biodiversity here in panel A has been declining because of increasing pressure in panel B, despite policy response rising in panel C. There's a, a lot of science gone into those um, aggregate indices, but it's a broad measure. The state of fisheries is in a mess. We've collapsed a roughly a quarter of them, overexploited a third, uh, fully exploiting another third, and there's, there's relatively little left that isn't uh, under, under substantial pressure. And of course, on climate, uh, we've got, you know, for two degrees, we can afford to burn you know, another trillion and a bit tons of CO2, half a trillion-ish tons of carbon. And we've got far, far, far more carbon locked away in the form of oil, gas, and coal than we can ever afford to burn. So the problem we have there is peak atmosphere. So we've got some big environmental problems. And it's understandable when faced with those problems to think, well, maybe we do need to think hard about this economic growth business and possibly stop it. I don't, you know, don't condemn you to the lunatic asylum. If you think that way, you probably condemn me. Uh, but I think zero growth is not the answer for three reasons. The first is that to get on top of those three problems, and there are some other uh, environmental problems, um, we're going to need uh, quite a lot of innovation. And innovation is going to deliver us the sorts of economic growth that we're used to having, because growth in GDP is a measure of the growth of the value of the goods and services that we are able to produce and share with each other. Secondly, addressing these problems through economic growth um, isn't all that smart, because cutting output is actually one of the most expensive ways of addressing most of these problems. People talk about how expensive carbon capture and sequestration is and et cetera, and how difficult it'll be and so on. It's a lot, lot cheaper than scaling back people's jobs uh, and the, the global economy. And finally, there are still a lot of very, very poor people in the world who need and deserve and uh, have a justifiable claim to increases in their material living standards. So for those three main reasons, zero economic growth is not the way we need to be addressing either climate change or any of these other environmental challenges. So we need to look somewhere else and we need to ask ourselves what sort of growth we want. So let me do the detour. Uh, before we get into the green growth question, let's ask ourselves what are we really aim aiming at here? Because I think for those of you in the audience and uh, online thinking this guy's nuts, 
uh, we really do need to stop economic growth, it's probably because you've got a sense that the objective of human economic activity, human society, we've got our objectives all wrong. We're on an endless treadmill of more and more material consumption and it's delivering us nothing. So let's have that discussion about objectives. And I'm the first to say that a lot of what matters in life isn't very easily measurable and that taking stock of what we should value is a very tricky, multi-dimensional task at an individual level. Are we aiming at happiness? I would say probably not. Are we aiming at some form of human flourishing or self-actualization, some measure of the virtuous life, deepening relationships with others, or a broader contribution to society? They're all reasonable things to think that one perhaps ought to be aiming at with your own personal life. From a social and a collective point of view, I think the role of government is a little bit different. It's probably not to spell out for individuals what to aim for. You're going to make your own decisions, I make mine, about what my definition of the good life is. But I think it's the role of our collective institutions to provide us with a framework, with perhaps some freedoms, uh, wealth, capabilities, economic output, yes, possibly equality, possibly increases in output year on year because they're related to unemployment and other important macroeconomic variables and reducing poverty. But one of the challenges that we have is that amongst those various, and there are other, of course, amongst those various social aims that we might look for, there's one, of course, that takes preeminence, and that is GDP and measures of economic output. And so one of the things I would like to contend to you today is that the obsession with output, it's not that it's not useful, it's, I mean, I'm sure some of you think it isn't useful, but it is quite helpful to have a measure of the flow of goods and services through the economy year on year, quarter on quarter, because it helps you to manage things in the short run. But it's not the only, and it's probably not even the most important metric that we should be thinking about. So how do we get other metrics into the public discourse? It's kind of easier said than done. And my claim is that wealth is a metric that is beginning to have traction within national statistical agencies and treasuries. It may not be your idea of the best metric, but it has this going for it. It's a, it's a stock measure, not a flow measure. And that's important because a measure of the stock, so the water in the bathtub rather than the flow going into the bathtub or the flow going out of the bathtub, a stock measure like wealth is forward looking. It's backward looking in the sense that we've built up a stock of wealth over time, but the value of our assets is a function of what they can deliver to us in the future. So wealth as a metric naturally encompasses at least a kind of 20, 25, 30 year look into the future, unlike the quarterly measure of GDP. You can divide it into its composite components and you can see immediately when you look at them that they're broader than just output. So human capital, education, schooling, skills, etc. Natural capital, physical produced capital, like the, this screen, like the ability to webcast, this lovely lecture theatre. Social and institutional capital, the fact that we can get together without, I'm certainly standing here, I'm not worried that someone's about to shoot me because we have a good, maybe I ought to be, uh, but <laughs> we have a good social fabric and structure that means that we can rely on each other, you know, we can trust each other to interact uh, more or less kindly and often generously and with goodwill towards each other. We've got the rule of law apart from anything else, so if you do shoot me, you'll get locked up. Uh, intellectual property and net financial assets. So you can divide up those components of wealth and you can start to measure them. And we are starting to see measurements of wealth across different countries. And here is a list in 2005. Here's the UK at... Uh, over 600,000 US dollars per person of total wealth. Um, these, sh these numbers should be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. They're the best that can be done uh, more or less at the moment, but um, you know, I think there's, it's fairly clear that there's a lot more work to be done on these, but you've got measures of human capital here in purple. It's obviously fairly substantial. Intangible uh, you know, social capital. Natural capital here is a tiny little green slice. You may wish to argue with that perhaps later, produce capital and so on. So while natural capital, as you can see, is a low proportion of 
uh, capital in the total accounts. Nonetheless, this viewpoint, I think, would help us enormously in thinking about protecting what is left of our natural capital uh, and reshifting the objective function of public policy and public decision makers onto the stock rather than the flow and onto things that are likely to help to steer our public policy into a better direction. Whoops. I think I might have sent a or loaded a slightly earlier version of this presentation. Um, anyway, so let me move uh, not seamlessly on to creating green economic growth. Um, and I want to start with the fact that uh, green growth is one of the dominant narratives of the international financial institutions that are around today or the broader concept of sustainable, resilient, inclusive growth. It's indeed, I would say, the default narrative. And hopefully, uh, I'm going to be able to unpick that a bit. If not, I'm going to do a little bit of very rapid IT work uh, and um, load up uh, an updated presentation. But I want to start with the maths. I'm told that every equation that you put in a book halves your audience. So I thought I'd test this out and see if half of you got up and left. <laughs> One did. Um, but some fairly simple maths and fairly, fairly simple economic theory does tell you that there's no reason in theory that we can't keep the growth in the value of goods and services going forever. What it hinges upon are two conditions. The first one, um, I won't go through the maths for, for you guys today, but um, if you wish to, you can see it in a nice paper in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy on growth theory and green growth. Um, there is a, uh, a couple of key conditions. The first is that as far as our natural capital stock goes, we're not using it up any faster than it is regenerating. That's what that equation basically means. We are doing that now. So we're not meeting these conditions, so we're nowhere near green growth. But in theory, if we start to just pull back a bit, let nature do the regeneration and consume the fruits of nature as they are being produced, rather than chopping down the tree and burning it before you know, some apples can flourish, uh, then we've got a sustainability criterion being met. And the other key sustainability criterion, which in fact isn't uh, wrapped up in these equations. We obviously have to consume less than we're, we're producing. But there's another one, which is to, to continue growing our economy year on year, we need to be using our brains and we need to be continually thinking. And so technological progress is a, is a key part of green growth. And the green growth story becomes about two twin features, not using up more than nature is giving us, and continually thinking, innovating, and generating more new ideas to keep the provision of goods and services becoming more and more valuable to each other year on year. And if you're interested in getting into the detail, you can have a look uh, in an Oxford Review of Economic Policy issue last year, which, which went very, very deep into a whole bunch of questions about green growth. The, the point I'd like you to take away today is that it means more than just getting the prices right. So a lot of economists um, start with uh, as they ought to, the fact that if we were to have a green economy, we need to have appropriate prices on natural assets so they're not used and abused as if their price is zero. And that's a, a very sensible, you know, it's a, a totally plausible place to start. If we could get them, that would be great. Uh, we can't always get them for other reasons. But even that is not enough here because the, the right prices are a function of the pathway macroeconomically speaking, that the economy is on. And uh, you know, so we do need some government guidance or at least some strategic planning about how we're going to direct the economy as a whole. So it's not just about getting the prices right, as important as that is. Um, and I will uh, perhaps leave you there to read a bit more on green growth if you wish. Um, and the idea... Uh, that um, further ideas generate more ideas, uh, which is a core part of the technological progress piece of green growth, is itself not a very new idea, uh, 1998. Uh, and what we are doing at the Oxford Martin School Institute for New Economic Thinking is thinking about the production function for new knowledge uh, in relation to, to clean technologies. Okay. I might 
um, can I check with Tom, just go a little bit off piste and plug in my own laptop, So, because I've got a few extra slides that I would like to share with you um, before I end up uh, presenting an old slide deck that hasn't been updated circa one hour ago. Just need a little adapter. Oh, uh, that is not the right one. Excellent. Thanks very much. Actually, you know what? I'll just tell you what I was going to say anyway, without slides. It's just, uh, it's just as easy. So um, you're not really missing much. A few pretty pictures, uh, that's really about it. Um, the, uh, the few th key things that I wanted to say about how to generate and to deliver um, green growth relate to the fact that the, with these environmental problems, we can go on continuing to use vast amounts of material resources to use up the atmosphere, to use up our biodiversity, and to um, use up our uh, uh, fisheries, etc. Or we can be clever. And so really the challenge for us is to have more mind and less matter, effectively. And uh, feeling rather pleased with myself that I'd come up with this nice little phrase, more mind, less matter, although not feeling all that pleased with my technological skill right now. Uh, I put that into Google to find the, uh, the question popping up, did you mean more mindless matter? <laughs> <laughs> Which is the opposite of what I meant. But, with the, but I, we do, in fact, need exactly more mind and less matter. And what I want to share with you is the fact that there is actually quite a lot of mind going into solving these challenges right now. So it hasn't escaped the attention of clever scientists and physicists that we do have 5.5 million exajoules of solar coming into the, onto the planet every year. And at the Oxford Martin School in the solar PV labs here, you will have, I hope, heard about the advances that have been made in perovskites. Up in Manchester, we've had remarkable advances in graphene as a material. And the thing that's exciting for me is that when you put these new materials together, you're, you're able to access a greater proportion of the visible spectrum. You can do it at much greater efficiencies and increasingly lower costs. And what we're getting is a, a discontinuous jump in the technology for generating power. So if you think about all the forms of power generation that we have, whether it's nuclear, coal, gas, oil, they all involve the same broad mechanism of heating a fluid to turn a turbine to generate alternating current, including concentrated solar power, for that matter. So we've, we've had one stock of a technological approach to generating power, and solar PV is, is a step change in technological advance because it generates directly uh, electricity from the photosensitive layer. The other thing that we find, and this is also work being done at the Oxford Martin School at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, is that the rate of technological advance in different technologies varies uh, from technology to technology, but it actually seems to follow a number of fairly regular rules. And 
uh, we have found that the rates of cost decline in solar PV modules are fairly reliably 9% year on year. Now, if you compare that to the long run rate of advance in the cost of generating electric electricity from coal, that's roughly 0% year on year. So whether it's, you know, it's not gonna be this year or next year or in 10 years time, we will be seeing a situation where mines will win over matter. We will need less uh, processes to dig up dirty black stuff out of the ground and to burn it to power our economies and we will have a much smarter set of integrated um, solar directly, solar capturing technologies that power our grids and power our civilization. And then once you've got that new array of electricity generating technologies, of course you need other new technologies um, and we have uh, engineers, physicists, etc., working on smart grids, including here. We have a, a project that we hope to commence fairly shortly at Oxford on integrating large-scale renewable technologies onto the grid uh, and to, to you know, manage clever aspects of demand-side response, uh, storage of electrical power, uh, and so on. So there is an array of technologies coming down the line that demonstrate that we can have more mind and less matter. The challenge for us is that they're not coming fast enough for quite a lot of these problems. So if you project out the time at which solar would be thought to you know, cross, the, uh, cross the cost curve for coal, you're looking into the 2020s, maybe you know, around 2030, uh, in most places for most of the time. Of course, you can talk about anecdotes where solar is cheaper than coal uh, right now in various places. And we don't have that long to wait. And the reason we don't have that long to wait is because like the stock of wealth on the one hand, which we should be, care, care, could be uh, focusing on, we have a stock of emissions on the other hand uh, that is problematic. And one of the key messages that I hope all of you are aware of, but I'm gonna repeat it because it deserves repeating and because um, uh, certain high profile figures at Davos didn't seem to know it. Um, in order for us to stop heating our planet, we need to get to net zero emissions. It's not, you know, 80%, it's zero. And the, the reasons Miles Allen or his team in atmospheric physics or Tim Palmer can explain to you, it's about a nicely, finely balanced piece with the oceans and the atmosphere. But, but effectively, you know, if we stop emitting today, zero, then the 0.8 degrees that we've already locked in is there for hundreds of years. Now, it's not just that piece of inertia that we need to uh, manage. If you think about the capital stocks and infrastructure that we have that, is, that are based upon dirty um, you know, CO2 emitting technologies, which we are adding to year on year, not withdrawing from year on year, we're looking at somewhere between around 2025 and 2040 before we're at the point where we've locked in, effectively we are, we are committed to cumulative emissions that would you know, 50, give us a 50-50 chance of, of going above two degrees. So again, thinking about the stock of infrastructure assets helps us to trade that off against the stock or to understand the links with the stock of carbon emissions in the atmosphere, uh, which then relates to the stock of our wealth, which we would be damaging as we undermine our natural capital. Um, so the challenge for us isn't that we don't have smart people doing smart things, we do. And we've seen time and time again throughout human history that humans can come up with smart technologies to solve the problem. The challenge that we have is that our political institutions uh, are not supporting these efforts. Three key numbers which I'm fond of sharing, and I'll share again now, is that we spend or a couple of years ago, we spent about 500 billion uh, on direct fossil fuel subsidies. If you've seen the IMF report last week, the post-tax subsidy estimate is 5 trillion a year. Um, the global economy is only 70 trillion. Uh, so you can, you can have a think about the relativities there. So f 500 billion-ish on subsidizing fossil fuels, 500 billion-ish on exploring for new fossil fuels, odd given that we've got three or four times as much as we can afford to burn in reserves and many more times in resources. And by comparison, we only spend you know, 
maybe one or 200 billion supporting the full-scale deployment of existing renewable technologies, and even worse, only four billion a year of public money globally on the research and development. So the very thing that is gonna save us, the brains, more mind, less matter, we're spending a tiny fraction of our public budgets on. So if there's one thing that I think we could do collectively um, without kind of completely changing our political system, which is of course the other response that you can have to the paralysis that we, we see at the moment, uh, is to just bump up what is a very small number, four billion a year, uh, by a factor of two or three or four or five. And that would have, I think, a disproportionate effect. I mean, obviously you can't just suddenly double the number of scientists, but you, you could be ramping that up as fast as possible. All right, given that I've proven that technology doesn't always solve all of our problems today, what I might do is uh, wrap up and go to questions. So to remind you of the story that I wanted to tell. First, in many areas, humanity is doing phenomenally well. And we need to bear in mind that a lot of the environmental crises that we hear about are not crises. We're not running short of energy. We're not running short of oil or gas or coal or, or sunlight. Um, and we're not running short of stuff. But we do have real challenges in climate, in biodiversity, and in fisheries and other renewable resources. And one of the key reasons that they're the areas that we have challenges is because we don't have prices on those assets. We do have prices on the resources that we mine. But getting the right prices into place, even if we could do it, and we've seen that it's politically difficult to do, is not enough. Because we will need our collective institutions to guide us to a pathway uh, where we meet a kind of green growth objective. Now, current political arrangements are not generating sensible prices, and they're not likely to. You may well conclude, therefore, that you need to completely change the political systems that we have. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily wrong, but I would say good luck to you. Certainly no small challenge. So the alternative approach is to look for small interventions that are highly leveraged that can deliver system change and uh, shift the economic pathways into a cleaner direction. And my contention has been that those interventions are likely to be around stimulating and shifting the technological pathway off one which is dirtier and onto one which is cleaner. And once we're in a situation where clean is cheap, then I think the politics will be much easier. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cameron. Right, so we've got time for questions. Who wants to kick off? Um, the lady in red here. Hi. Um, you've focused an awful lot on the supply side. I wondered if you have thought about and are thinking about the demand side. And in an article I wrote about 10 years ago that was published in Cambridge Journal of Economics, I was arguing that one of the problems we face is that people don't become satiated. They have and generate infinite wants. And uh, you can never satisfy those in infinite wants. And you see it all around you in all the excess capacity with which we live. We live in bigger houses than we need. We have more cars parked in the driveway than we need. We have boats moored at the end of particular gardens that are never used, etc., etc. And all of those things are absorbing resources, which if we could persuade people to do something else with their money and their time, um, we could actually make quite a difference to the way we live now and the degree of pollution that exists. Anyway, I'll just throw that out and see what you think. Um, so I think it's very hard to change human nature and the, um, you know, the, the kind of hierarchy of needs that drives our behavior is going to be there. Now, what it is feasible to do or more feasible to do, I think, is to shift the way in which those needs are satisfied. Um, so it isn't necessarily the case that, as you say, we actually really need more and more material goods and services. It's a pretty tough ask. I don't focus on it because I think it's a job for sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, and others. 
uh, it's a hard job. And that's not to say it's an easy job. I mean, as far as um, inefficiency goes, I think this is where, I mean, this is a much easier task uh, and one which is underway, whether it's Airbnb or Uber or a million and one different internet enabled plays that co companies that are effectively using smarter information to, to increase utilization of existing resources. You know, there's much that can be done in that space, much that is b being done and, and will be done. I mean, I, I'm actually fairly relaxed about that. I think we'll see far better resource utilization as time passes. But that's not actually going to solve our big problems. Efficiency doesn't, by and large, solve the big problems. I think it is ultimately a supply side question um, because you know, I'm actually skeptical that you will deliver change on the demand side. I think it's, as I say, it's, it's fairly hard to change human nature, but even changing the way in which those needs are satisfied seems difficult to me. Uh, I, you know, if you can do it, I'm all praise and respect. Uh, for me, solving what is actually a fairly contained supply side problem of just switching, it is actually not that hard. I mean, there's a bunch of coal-fired power plants. We turn them off. We stick some wind farms and some solar plants and you know, nuclear power stations in instead. I mean, as far as technological challenges go, it isn't that difficult. The difficulty is that at the moment, those clean technologies are more costly and you know, for as long as that lasts, you've got a political and a social and an institutional problem. Who's next? Um, just behind the next one. Uh, I'm Jeff Burnham from Georgetown University. Um, turning your own analysis back on you, perhaps, what economic incentives do governments have to take the steps that you would recommend to reorder uh, fossil fuel subsidies and R&D? It seems to me that something more than economic incentives would be required to persuade governments to do what you think they should. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Governments, by and large, I mean, they are actually starting to do it. There's been considerable progress in the last two years, um, facilitated by bodies such as the IMF. Uh, the fear, of, of course, is that as soon as I remove these subsidies, I've got a popular revolt on my hand, um, and or the poor will suffer. So um, I mean, the, the, the challenge of removing them is, is political rather than economic. And the solutions are, um, are partly political, partly economic. So that you solve the poverty issue by ensuring that you've got a system in place to support the poor before you remove your subsidies so that the, you know, the, the cash that you save, which the IMF estimates would be in, in the five trillion framing, right? Uh, they estimate that there's a, there's a three trillion uh, saving for governments by, by removing, you know, eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. The cash that you save is then redirected to supporting the poor. And then as far as the kind of protests on the streets go, um, you, the, you are threatening powerful interests when you remove powerful interest subsidies. They're, they're not going to sit down and relax and tell you that's okay. Um, so a certain amount of spine is required and certain governments won't have it, uh, which is why you haven't seen fossil fuel subsidies being removed everywhere. But you have seen it in various countries and uh, it's because there's been a combination of spine and careful preparation and proper PR and good information and, and then mechanisms to ensure that the, the poor are supported. Next, um, in the middle. slightly semantic point, but I think it's important because you mentioned learning rates and they're very often expressed in terms of time and you just mentioned, you know, as time passes. And I used to work at the sharp end of Moore's law in the semiconductor industry and I can attest that it's not because time is passing that we're making these progress. There is some real effort and some real work behind it. And I wondered if we should recognize that a bit more explicitly that, you know, we're making these advances because we're actually committing resources and ideas to these things, not because we're waiting for time to pass. Well, I'm not going to disagree with you, Phil. Uh, of course, the um, so Moore's law, the idea that costs and power, etc., fall as a function of time, or Wright's law, the idea that they fall as a function of cumulative production. Wright's law is a little bit better than Moore's in that you've actually got a 
variable that might kind of have a theory behind it. And there's no theory behind stuff magically happening as time passes. So, so Moore's law is really just hiding the underlying processes and mechanisms that are delivering you, you the cost reductions. And um, as you probably know, Don Farmer here and the team are working on properly identifying those underlying mechanisms so we can get time out of the independent uh, variables that's used to explain the dependent variable of cost declines and start to really understand how to target the effort whether it's financial or you know clever scientists, which bits of the components of the supply chain need to be tackled most cleverly to keep bringing costs down. Hi there. You, it, it, when you're summarising your um, previous lecture series, you mentioned both that there um, it's good to have a club, and I think green tech was what you were pitching as the club that people wanted to join but also that it's good to invent a way of punishing the people who are yep. doing bad. But so most of the rest of your talk focused on the first of those, really, about the, um, mm -hmm. the idea of green tech being the club. Do you think we need both of them? In the fact, do we need to be able to punish people as well as welcoming them into a green tech club? And if you, <coughs> if you think we do need both of them, do you have any, can I sort of tease you out a bit about whether there are any economic solutions about how to punish the baddies? whether those are governments or particular companies that are behaving badly? Yep, sure. Um, great question. So uh, I can elaborate briefly on the incentives within a club and others, and I think Steve here has uh, had some of these ideas too. Um, what you want is a structure where um, members of the club get benefits. So, and if you're not a member of a club, you don't. So, um, I mean, the stick is the opposite of a carrot in a sense. So you've already started by creating a carrot to come in, which is to say, if so an example might be, like NATO, I'm not committing to some international institution that I'm not going to have any control over. You know, there are a lot of countries who don't like that idea. All I'm doing is saying I'm going to spend more than 0.01% of my public budget on energy sector R&D. So, uh, you know, uh, well, it's actually often 0.01%. 0.1%. So I'm going to ratchet up my spending in my own country on public sector R&D. And if I do that, I join this club in which I have zero trade barriers, so there's no tariffs on the trade of the fruits of that sort of activity. And there have been quiet discussions going on about a clean trade area over the course of the last 18 months or so. So they're the carrot side, uh, and the stick is the absence of the carrot in part, but there's another stick that you can add, which, um, which I think is actually going to be, I mean, it's certainly critical if you're going to do a deal on emissions. It's still probably, it's certainly very helpful if you're going to de do a deal on technology. And that is that if you don't comply, uh, you are actually hit with trade sanctions. And whether it's... Um, I mean, the, the obvious measure on carbon is border carbon adjustments. So if Europe has a price on carbon of 30 euros, um, wouldn't that be great? But suppose it did, and you're importing goods from another country with a price of zero, then you simply say, you know, you're welcome to bring your goods into our country or our region. Uh, you have to pay a price of 30 euros as well to level the playing field, and equally, for European exporters, you're welcome, obviously, to export to the other country. We'll give you a 30 euro subsidy at the border so that you're not disadvantaged. So that sort of mechanism, I mean, it is kind of economically child's play. It's completely obvious that we should do this. Uh, the difficulties, again, are that no one wants to disrupt what is a fragile trade regime. And there's a concern about um, you know, what's called dirty protectionism, that once you start to go down this road, countries will create all sorts of clever green ruses to justify imposing tariffs on other countries from uh, importing their goods and services. I, I think that fear is overdone. Um, you know, if, if head of the WTO were here, we could have a good argument about it. But I think it's overdone because you can actually um, calculate you know, in a fairly generous way, give the benefit of the doubt to the importer uh, a differential and impose it, and you'd still be much better off. So it's a, it's a slightly smaller stick than the optimal stick, but it's still a stick. 
And a small stick is better, much better than no stick. Um, up here, please. Um, one of your points was about how slow the natural advance of technology is without some political incentive to speed things up. And this comes down partly to the, I suppose, difference between those in power who think of things in the short term and the general population and children and grandchildren who think in the long term. Is there any incentive that could be done to get decision makers to think more in the long term? My example would be a maximum age for delegates to the climate change conferences because they will personally have to live through the consequences of their decisions. That's a very interesting idea. Wouldn't that be great? You should make it 21 and see, see, see what happens. No, I jest. Um, yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the little detour I took on wealth is intended precisely in that direction. So imagine for a moment... Um, that what the Daily Mail was interested in was whether the average British citizen was, you know, a thousand pounds better off under the last Conservative administration or four thousand pounds worse off. Instead of the economies growing again, imagine if the, the, the narrative were you are richer, you are poorer. And actually the narrative is often you're richer, you're poorer, but, but the way we talk about that is whether GDP's gone up or down which is nuts because it doesn't relate to, it's not even per capita GDP, which has gone down, let alone per capita wealth, which doesn't necess necessarily move with per capita GDP. So if you could get the wealth numbers onto the front pages and driving the political agenda, then those wealth numbers would be calculated by <coughs> treasuries and statistical agencies. And in calculating them, you're looking at the value of assets over the next 20 or 30 years. And so you're, by definition, into a longer-term framework of thinking. Uh, and so the amount of money that you stick into infrastructure, that's not you know, some wasteful spending. It's adding to your wealth. The wealth of the nation might rise. Suddenly you're thinking, oh, well, that, that seems like a good policy because the mail will be saying, you know, the average Briton is better off under my government. The amount of money you put into R&D, into generating new ideas, into protecting natural capital, all of these things would increase wealth. And so th this, is, this is why I think it's not a bad shift. It's not the only way of addressing your point, obviously, but it's how I've chosen to. Next, uh, that gentleman there, please. Uh, what are your thoughts about the merits or demerits of fossil fuel divestment as one little component of the stick? Very good question. So we have a process going on here at the Oxford Martin School on um, safe carbon. And the idea is to take uh, climate scientists, economists, financiers, and a, a, a spectrum of stakeholders from the financial community and ask ourselves what a scientifically, economically, etc., informed approach to this issue would be. Uh, my view is that the, so I don't speak for them now, I'm speaking for me, just to be clear. My, my view is that the divestment campaign has been extremely useful. There are conversations happening now within the financial community, within the boards of fossil fuel companies that simply weren't hap happening a couple of years ago. Uh, they've opened up the space for me to have conversations that are viewed as far less you know, out there, but which are quite rational. Um, and that space wasn't there uh, a year or two ago. As for the actual act of divestment, um, you know, the, I mean, the really, the point of the campaign, I think, for most people, well, it's one of three things. It's either a moral thing, you know, this is bad, don't do it. I don't care what the consequences are, I just don't do bad things. I'm a virtuous person. Or it's, uh, it might be consequentialist, but with it looking at the system as a whole. So if I make a big ruckus about this, it gets on the front page, it creates a kind of political climate in which fossil fuels are stigmatised, um, policy starts to turn against them, the financial markets turn, start to turn against them, you know, we might make some more progress at Paris, that sort of thing. All 
you know, plausible enough. The, the, the problem, though, with that line of thinking is that at the end of the day, we, we are still an 85, you know, almost 90% fossil-powered economy. We can't turn them off tomorrow. We can't even turn them off in 10 years. We probably can't turn them off in a couple of decades or three decades. So my, and, and I, I think it's probably fair to say our, but you know, I um, hesitate, I don't speak for everyone, but our thinking is given the world as it is, given the need to accelerate off fossil fuels very quickly, but the fact that we still do need them for the, sh the, the short term, next 10 years, how do we use the energy very positive energy that is behind this campaign and turn it into something, you know, sensible that is guided by the science. So that's what we're working on and, um, and we will report, have another meeting in September and hopefully report, uh, to, well, uh, in due course. More questions um, in the chat there. Uh, hello, thanks for a very interesting talk. If I could just jump back to that question of wealth again. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand on how moving from the stock of a fossil fuel to the flow of a renewable fuels uh, would affect wealth overall in that measurement. Right, so um, the, the fossil fuels that we have are, uh, are stocks, they are booked as part of the wealth accounts in countries. They're booked as assets on the books of the, you know, the, the listed companies that own them. If we have a, a, a if we were to suddenly tomorrow transition to a 100% you know, clean society, which of course we're not gonna do, then those assets, the value of those assets collapses to zero and you've got you know, some interesting knock-on effects. Um, now, most of the way those assets are valued is over a 20 to 30 year lifetime, just of the way discounting works. So for any stocks that are gonna see out their 20 or 30 year lifetime, their asset values are probably not largely affected by the shift to a cleaner economy. For, uh, but there are plenty of assets that do last for much longer than 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 uh, years. And um, so, you know, there's a program here at Oxford called the Stranded Assets Program within the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment that looks at the risk to fossil fuels of what's called asset stranding by this transition uh, and makes the point that if you do face large risks of having to write down the value of your fossil fuels on BP's books or on Shell's books or on Glencore or Vitol or Rio Tinto's books, um, then you might want to think twice about spending very large amounts of money adding further such assets that may need to be written down. And so there are movements afoot to think about, uh, you know, perhaps asking, uh, using shareholder pressure, shareholder resolutions to ask the management of such companies to think about the relative uh, weights that they are placing on further uh, capital expenditure on creating more fossil fuel reserves on the one hand versus the distribution of money back to shareholders on the other hand. Uh, and that is again a result of this fossil fuel divestment campaign that, that I think is leading to some interesting conversations. Do we have more questions? Do I oh yes, um, this Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm glad to hear some op optimism when you talked about we're not running out of um, things. You, um, you were, when you mentioned scarcity earlier, you gave a lot of graphs about various rare metals and not so rare metals. Um, I was wondering about materials in, say, so solar panels and uranium, for example. Are, are we, how, how well are we doing for those things? Are they likely to run out or not? Yeah, so look, I mean, if you, if you look hard enough, uh, and we are actually right now looking very hard, uh, the team in my group, the Economics of Sustainability, are pouring over 30 years of data on every single mineral we can find to make sure that we haven't missed anything. But if you look hard enough, I'm sure there's something in there that is gonna be, uh, uh, perhaps cause some problems. I don't know, I mean, maybe not. But certainly on the so-called rare earths within, um, that are used in a lot of the renewables, they're not actually all that rare. Uh, it's, a, it's a chemical terminology, not, not an economic point. Um, uranium, 
current supplies, I think, stand, someone here will correct me doubt, doubtless, but I think uh, last time I looked 90 years-ish uh, at current rates. I mean, these numbers are all slightly fuzzy, uh, but I'm not, I'm not remotely worried about us running out of uranium, and if we do, there's plenty of thorium, and we can probably reprocess a lot of, there's a lot of warheads that hopefully we won't ever use. Um, so uh, I'm not worried about that. I mean, I, I'm really very confident, actually, um, that we don't need to worry about running out of things. Um, if any of you heard Jeremy Grantham talk at the business school a few months ago, you know, he's a very intelligent and extremely rich man. He takes a different view, and we had a discussion about it um, that was fairly robust that continued over dinner. Um, so there are other intelligent views out there, but I just don't think they're supported by the data. Any more questions? And there's one here. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in what you think are the implications for democratic governance and all this. Um, I come to this as an amateur, so correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that China's kind of moved quite rapidly toward understanding the importance of environmental controls in a way that it didn't 15 years ago. It can do that because they don't actually have to worry too much about political opposition internally. And that's a good thing. Um, Perhaps one of the benefits of ISIS is that they will take over areas where there will be no productivity at all, since they clearly can't run a, any kind of economy. Um, but what I'm thinking about is, can you see the kind of changes that you want to see happening in the kind of plutocratic democracies that we've moved to, um, where there don't seem to be the levers of power that can make the kind of changes that, that, that you're looking for? Yeah, it's, a, it's an oft-posed question. I mean, I certainly don't think that you say, well, let's move back to an autocratic society to get this job done, so I'm not in that camp. Um, the, and, and it's worth remembering that it's the, the capability that China is showing on clean energy um, now, and we hope will continue, is also the capability that post-entry to the WTO they showed to get their emissions per head up from one or two tonnes a person up to more than Europe today, eight or nine tons a person. So it's the same capability operating in both directions. So, um, look, I think, um, you know, different, it's different horses, different courses for different horses. Oh, what is that phrase? Anyway, you know, yeah, that, that one. Um, and the, uh, the challenge that we have in democracies uh, and global governments more generally does make solving collective action problems more difficult. That's for sure. Uh, but I don't think we lament that fact. You work within it, and as I was saying, either you... Well, okay, people disagree. I debated George Monbiot in this room uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I think, where he thinks the whole political system should be overthrown and we should replace it with something else, and I, m my view is that there are smaller, more leveraged points within the existing political structure. You know, great if we get a change in values, great if we get a change in political system, but I, I would hate to be reliant upon such radical social change. And I think uh, we can make progress using smarter, using our brains. More mind, less matter. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, this gentleman here in the middle. All right, thank you for a, for a very nice talk. Um, you talked about uh, changing the metric from GDP flow to wealth, stock, um, should governments be legislating um, for corporations to be measuring their activities in the same way? I think, um, so within the realms of interventions that you can uh, force upon corporations, and there's lots that is discussed, um, greater transparency and greater uh, logic and sense within their accounting uh, practices is one of the good ones because I think it is reasonable for our large companies to be open with us about what they're doing and it's also important that they are accounting for their assets in a sensible way so that the shareholders can get an appropriate sense of what future returns might be. And so there, there are various initiatives underway, Nicholas I know you're aware of some of them, um, that, uh, that would help this process along and I, I, think, I think they're to be welcomed. Who's next? I think we're all done. Oh, 
No, oh, I thought you were putting your hand up. Sorry. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was a great way to end our seminar series. Um, like I say, we have got an event next Wednesday. Please do keep checking our website because we're bound to have others uh, added before the end of term. Um, but if not, we'll see you in the autumn for more. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.